Okay, this is our first lesson in <clears throat> uh, Modern Arithmetic 4. So we're going to take some time to uh, have an introduction to Modern Arithmetic, so make sure you're paying attention. And this is the highest level of Modern Arithmetic. This is the highest level in the Rays series, which is, which is the, best, um, the best way to learn Modern Arithmetic. You have modern arithmetic one, which is for babies, modern arithmetic two, three, level four. This is as high as it goes in arithmetic. So when we cover these lessons, we're covering everything in arithmetic. Okay? Modern arithmetic. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. What I want you to do is make sure you're in your books, you're looking at the table of contents. <clears throat> we're going to have a, a, an introduction to modern arithmetic in general that I'm going to talk through on the board here and then we're going to go through the table of contents together so you can see what the course covers and then we're going to start going through the first uh, the first lesson which is just definitions and terms okay so be looking at the table of contents in your book I'm going to go back and forth between the board and the book all right so what we want to talk about is um, modern arithmetic four and what I want to explain for you is what high school math looks like. What is high school math, <clears throat> modern high school math requirements? When we look at high school math, high school mathematics, <clears throat> we want 120 hours per year for high school math. This is for your high school diploma. We want 120 hours of math study per year times four years. So that means for a, <clears throat> a good high school math education, for a high school diploma, you want a total of 480 instructional hours. <clears throat> 480 hours. That's quite a bit of time. 480 hours. All right? And what a what a selective college, a good college wants, all right? You can have you can have bobo math lessons, or you can have a decent math education in a modern high school. What a modern college wants is four years of high school level studies, and that doesn't include this course. Higher arithmetic or arithmetic four is actually assumed in high school. It's assumed you already know arithmetic. But the problem is most students don't. Most students have not mastered arithmetic, and that causes them to have trouble in other subjects like algebra. Because you have to study fractions and multiplication and division, all that stuff, square roots, exponents. You have to study that in algebra, and if you never learned it in arithmetic, if you never mastered it, you're never going to understand it in algebra. And people complain about algebra as if algebra is the problem, but algebra is not the problem. The problem is they actually don't know arithmetic. You understand that? So you get to rules in algebra about square roots and fractions and exponents and all this, and they struggle in algebra, get low grades in algebra, but it's actually not algebra that they're struggling with. They don't know arithmetic. So even though this is not included in a normal high school math program, we're going to study this as part of high school math because if you learn arithmetic, the other subjects will be easier, like algebra, okay? So what a high school curriculum for math usually looks like is this, and I'd like you to write this down because I want you to understand why you're studying what you're studying. <clears throat> a normal high school math program will start out with algebra, And I'll explain what algebra is in a minute. And then it usually moves on into geometry. And then in the third year of high school, <clears throat> normally students take a second year of algebra. And most students, students who just want a high school diploma, often stop taking math classes after 11th grade. They stop because it's not required for a high school diploma. 
But that's not a good idea if you're planning to go to college. And so to go on to continue studying math, the next course is usually a course called trigonometry. Sometimes it's called pre-calculus. <clears throat> and then there's a fifth, a fifth option, which is to go on and study calculus in high school. Okay, so that's the normal set of courses in a modern high school math program. Algebra, geometry, algebra 2, and then either trigonometry or pre-calculus. And the highest level that students normally get to is calculus. In our courses in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, <coughs> you have access to all these studies. So if, you, if you'd like to run through that whole entire marathon of math studies, modern math studies, you can. All right, algebra, geometry, a second year of algebra, trigonometry, or pre-calculus, and then fifth is calculus. Now, what's important to understand is if you're applying for college and you're going to take the SAT, pay attention here just for one minute. You can finish copying this in a second. If you're going to take the SAT, a big part of the SAT is math. It's like half of your SAT score, okay? The SAT only tests through Algebra 2. It's Geometry and Algebra. That's the SAT test, okay? So to prepare to get a high SAT score, which is required to get into a, a selective university, trigonometry and calculus don't necessarily help you. A lot of students rush into these higher level classes and actually cause their SAT scores to be lower because it's not, these things are not on the SAT test. Okay, <clears throat> so the only time that you should go into these subjects is if you've really mastered these subjects and you can get a high SAT score. Okay, if you can't do that, then you should not take these other courses and you should spend more time on those subjects. <clears throat> so the normal course of high school studies is algebra and geometry. And like I said, arithmetic is not on the list because it assumes, it assumes you've already done arithmetic. But like I said, most students have not mastered arithmetic and they struggle in math all through high school because it's assumed that they studied something that they never really studied. Okay? So we're going to... In addition to all this, we're going to add a careful study of arithmetic in this course, Modern Arithmetic 4. And we're going to make sure that we understand all the details of arithmetic so that our study of algebra <clears throat> and the other mathematical sciences is easier because we actually know what we need to know. All right? So we'll study through algebra together. Geometry, when, when we read geometry, okay, you know, we have classical geometry in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. We have classical, ge that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about modern geometry. That's a different textbook. And in, in Ray's mathematics series, in these Ray's books, there are two courses in geometry that are modern geometry. It's not the same thing as classical geometry, okay? But we'll if you guys want to, we'll go through all of these maths. It's not hard. It's just a matter of going through them one chapter at a time through the whole books. Okay? In this course, we're going to study <clears throat> arithmetic. In the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, the course is called Modern Arithmetic 4. It's the highest level, <clears throat> the highest level of arithmetic that there is. There's no other... There's no higher book or higher course. So in this course, we're going to study Modern Arithmetic 4. <clears throat> Not normally in a high school program, but like I said, one of the reasons why students struggle in math is because they don't know arithmetic. Just the basics. So we're going to make sure that we know all the basics. <clears throat> okay? 
So we need 120 hours of math studies in these subjects by four years of math studies, which is a total of 480 hours of math. That's the minimum for a selective college. That's not, that's not great. That's the minimum for a selective college. We want to do more than that. Okay? That's not a lot. 120 hours, there's 365 days in a year. 120 hours is one hour for only one third of the days of the year. If you did an hour of math study for two thirds of the year, it'd be like 240 hours in one year. If you multiplied that by four years of study, right, that would be 960 hours. And a high school program normally only has 480. So you can easily blow past these studies and do really well. It's just a matter of putting in the time. All right. So let's go back now and look at the textbook. <clears throat> let's look at the table of contents and we'll see what's in Modern Arithmetic 4. As you've already studied Arithmetic, Arithmetic 2, Arithmetic 3, you've already been through some of those books. Um, a lot of this is familiar. It's the same subjects. We have an introduction. You're looking at the table of contents on your book, right? <clears throat> we start with an introduction where we're just going to learn the definitions of terms. And that's very important because, like I said, most of the time students struggle in math, they don't even know what the words mean. And that's why they're struggling. Not because of complex math. They just don't know what the words even mean because they never learn the definitions. All right, so we're going to make sure we take our time, learn the definitions of words. So when you see a word, you know what it means. If you see the word polynomial in algebra, you actually know what that means. It's not complicated. Okay? If you see square root or decimal, you know what it means reciprocal. It's just a word with a definition. There's nothing complicated. But most students struggle because they don't know what the words mean. Okay? And you know that that's true from your own experience. If I were to say to you, hey, you've studied arithmetic three, what's a reciprocal? You see, it's, that's the problem. We don't, we don't know definitions. It's not that the ideas are complicated. We just haven't taken the time to master the definitions of the words. And if we do that, it all becomes simple. So in the introduction, we get into some basic definitions of important terms for the study of arithmetic. In section two, you see numeration and notation. That just means counting and writing numbers. And it's important because in arithmetic, many of you will get problems wrong because you're just sloppy or you don't, you don't write the numbers clearly as you need to write them to perform calculations. So, so knowing how to write the numbers, knowing how to write them neatly is actually an important part of arithmetic because if you write something sloppy, it can lead you to wrong answers. <clears throat> then we get into addition, subtraction, multiplication, these are called the four basic operations. The four operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. We'll go through all of those details. <clears throat> then we get into the properties of numbers, really studying what's called number theory, how numbers relate to each other. You see the topics there are factoring, the greatest common divisor, least common multiple. You've worked with those things before, right? A little bit in arithmetic three, okay? We'll make sure we get into all those things and go through it clearly. Then we get into fractions. Fractions confuse a lot of students, but they're very simple. You just have to make sure you learn the basics. We'll study fractions, how to reduce fractions, how to find common denominators, how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide fractions. All of that in Chapter 9. In Chapter 10, we talk about decimals. Uh, chapter 10, circulating decimals. Chapter 11, compound denominant numbers, compound numbers. That's when we have like different units, right? Like pounds and ounces. 
if we have to add different weights and we have pounds and ounces, we have to convert ounces to pounds and right, figure out um, how to add and subtract, multiply and divide compound numbers. We get into that in chapter 11. Notice in chapter 11, we also study the metric system, right? That's centimeters, meters, meters, okay? Um, the metric system is in chapter 11, how to work with the metric system. Then we get into ratio, proportion, percentages in chapter 14, applications of percentages. That means working with real life problems in chapters 15 and 16. <clears throat> and just scrolling through this. Then we get into a bunch of uh, practical issues like business. You see that chapter 17 is about partnership and bankruptcy. Um, and then we get into involution, evolution of square roots, cube roots, arithmetical and geometrical progression, measurements in chapter 22. Chapter 23, the last chapter, it says miscellaneous exercises. Miscellaneous just means a bunch of different kinds of exercises. So we, in that last chapter, we basically put all of this to work and do all kinds of different problems, all right? Now, one problem students often have with math is they ask, when am I ever going to use this stuff, okay? For example, we have in that one lesson, geometrical progression. Geometrical, when are you ever going to learn to use geometrical progression? in your life. How often do you think mom sits at the table and does work with geometrical progressions? Ever? Ever? I own my own business. Do you think I ever use some of these ideas? No, you don't. But that's not why we study them, okay? One of the reasons why we study all these different concepts is because they, they introduce ideas to us and the ideas, the ideas themselves can be helpful to figure out other things. Do you understand that? So you might never need to use some of these topics in arithmetic, but you may need to use the idea of that topic in some area of your life. Do you understand that? Okay. If you want to run a business, if you want to start a business, you have to figure out how to design a business that in the end, after you buy all your supplies, after you spend all your money on the costs, you have to buy fuel, you have to you know, travel, you have to pay for advertising, you have to pay for websites, you have to pay for an office, for utilities. You have all these expenses for your business, then you have to come up with the plan for your business, what you're going to charge the customers, then you have to compete against other businesses. All of that math that needs to be done in business is very complicated. Like when you look at Amazon, if you look at Amazon.com and you think about how in the world do they figure out how much to charge for a pair of shoes and it includes what it costs to ship it and they can ship it on the same day. How in the world do they figure out what to charge? How do they figure out how much it costs? How do they make it just as cheap? as Walmart, which is right down the, how does Walmart figure, how does Amazon figure out that business? They have different products coming from all different places all over the country. You can place an order and get 10 different things and they come from 10 different states. And Amazon has a shipping price. How in the world do they figure out that shipping price? How in the world do they figure out what to charge? for that product? How do they give hundreds of thousands of hours of video away for free? Why do they do that? Right? All of those complicated things, it's all mathematics. The whole entire business is based on mathematics. There are some nerds in the background figuring out all of the mathematics to make sure that everything makes money in the end even though they may lose millions of dollars on certain things. Like Prime Video, they may lose millions of dollars by offering all those videos for free, but they do it for a reason. Why do you think they do it? Why do you think, they, why do you think Amazon 
is interested in having free videos on their website. Just to bring people to their website. If you want to watch a movie, you're going to the Amazon website to watch a movie. That's why Amazon makes it for free, because they consider it advertising. And even though they might lose a million dollars by making all those videos free, they gain because you're on their website looking at all of the products that they're advertising all over the place. You're starting to click around in the website. It's all calculated. You see what I mean? So like a business like that, is, it's all complicated mathematics behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, you look at Elon Musk designing electric cars and rockets and all. He himself is, is not a businessman. He's a physicist. He's a scientist. He's a mathematician. He's a, he's a nerd. He's an engineer. And so you can look at what he does and you can say, now that's cool, right? Designing electric cars is cool. Yeah, but in order to design electric cars, all this mathematical knowledge has to be known. How do they figure out how long a charge needs to last in a car or what the car needs to cost? You know? How do they figure out what a car needs to cost? When you use a Tesla, you don't have to buy gas ever again. So if you're Elon Musk and you know that your customer never needs to buy gas again, do you raise your price? Because he's going to save on all that gas. Why not raise the, or do you keep the price low? So you sell more cars, right? All of that, all of that calculation, Every detail of the car, how it's made, where the parts come from, what kind of metal to use, where to get the batteries from, every single detail of that business, which you might look at on the surface and say, now that's cool. That whole business is built on mathematics, behind the scenes. Nerdy, boring, hardworking mathematics. You understand that? Hmm? So a lot of the cool work you see, it's cool on the surface, but behind the scenes, it's all mathematics. It's all scientific experimentation and research, hard, boring, grinding work behind the scenes that at the end produces this cool product. But you can't get to that cool product unless you are able to do that work behind the scenes. And that's true for any business, any business. It comes down to mathematics behind the scenes, all right? So a lot of these topics you may never use, but the ideas of these topics you will use and you can use, the ideas, even if you don't use the actual skills themselves, all right? So we'll go through all this. This is Modern Arithmetic 4, and like I said, it's the highest level of arithmetic that there is to study for modern schools. And when you study this, whether you're 10 years old or 17 years old, you're done with arithmetic for high school, modern arithmetic, okay? So we're going to go through it together. So let's look at the first page, the introduction. <clears throat> in my copy here, it's page 16 in the document. Let's look at the introduction. So what we're going to look at in this first chapter are definitions that are just about mathematics itself or arithmetic itself, general definitions, okay? <clears throat> and we're just going to walk through these. Now, do you need to memorize these definitions? You should. You should memorize definitions because some people like to say, I don't like to memorize. I like to, I like to use my own words. The problem with that is that your words aren't as good as the words of a great writer on arithmetic. You understand that? So we don't want to rely on our own. It's actually not easier to write things in your own words. Most of the time it's easier just to memorize the words that an expert wrote for us. You understand that? Plus, in this book... Whenever he uses these words, whenever the author uses these words in this book, this is what he means by those words. So your definition doesn't necessarily make any sense when he uses this word. So 
Should you memorize definitions? Yes. If you can, you should memorize definitions. It's the easiest and best way to learn the terms. And like I said, one of the reasons why kids struggle with math is not because math is hard, but because they don't know what the words even mean. That's why they struggle with math. Okay? So I recommend you do memorize the words, and I'll give you quizzes on these lessons that test your knowledge of the definitions. Right? So let's just get started. <clears throat> the first definition, Article 1, is the definition of definition. Makes sense, right? Let's define what a definition is before we get into um, definitions. What is a definition? A definition is a concise, concise, that means it's very clear and it uses the fewest possible words. It's concise, it's like a sharp definition, okay? A definition is a concise description of any object of thought. A definition is a concise description of any object of thought. Now, if you're taking notes, you don't need to write the definition. If you're taking notes, just write in your notes, memorize definition of definition. You see what I mean? You don't need to write the definition. It's already in your book. Your notes are just a record of what we talk about in class. So you don't have to write the definition. Just write, memorize definition one. Okay? <clears throat> so in two weeks, if you want to go over your notes and remember what we did in class, you have a record of what we did in class. You don't have to write the definitions down. It's already in your book. A definition is a concise description of any object of thought. A concise description, not wordy. It's not some babbling. It's a description that's as clear and as brief as possible. Okay? And it has to do something else. Look at the second part of the definition. It must be of such a nature to distinguish the object described from all other objects. So a true definition cannot be true of any other thing. It's only true of that one thing. That's what makes it a definition. Okay? So if I said the definition of a cat, if I say what is a cat, define cat, and you say a cat is a four-footed animal, is that a definition of a cat? No. Does it describe a cat? Is that a description of a cat? Yes. Right? A description isn't a definition. The definition would have to distinguish the cat from every other animal. And when you try to do that, it's very hard. It's very hard to define things. It's very hard to write definitions. You actually have to be a philosopher to write a definition. It's very hard. Just think about it. How would you define cat? A cat is what? Purring a purring animal. So you would use purring as, I'm, I'm being serious, you would use purring as the quality that distinguishes a cat from all other animals. Not all animals have it. Okay, but, right, but you see that it's difficult. All right? Maybe purring is that characteristic. Maybe it's something else. Like, did you know that if I was to define a man, just to, to compare this, man is the only animal that can laugh. So would it be right to say a man is a laughing animal? Would that be a definition? It's hard. That's what I think purring animal is. It's true, but it's not the definition. Okay? Just like laughing animal is true only for man, but it's not the definition. It's not what makes, it's not what makes a cat a cat. <coughs> you see what I mean? All right? So definitions are difficult. Now, the way that we normally make a definition 
Let me just show you this real quick. The way that we normally make a definition in philosophy, and you'll, we'll study this in classical reasoning. <clears throat> the way that we normally make a definition, when we define a term, the first thing we do is we name a genus. <clears throat> and what a genus is, is a category. A genus is a class of things to which something belongs. So if I was to take, here's Daniel. All right? Daniel is an individual something. If I was to say, what class of things does Daniel belong to? What, do you, what would you think the class would be without making fun of him? Okay, uh, man, we'll say man, all right? That would, be <coughs> that would be the genus to which he belongs, all right? And if I was going to define Daniel, the first thing I would do is identify the genus to which he belongs. And then what I have to do secondly is I have to give the difference I have to name the difference between Daniel and all other members of that genus. And if I can name the genus that he belongs to and the difference between him and every other man, then I have the definition. Okay? So we might say something like, <coughs> we have to figure out how Daniel is different from every other person. And the truth is, for a, for a man, the difference is in your name. Okay? Daniel has two names. Because inside of man, he belongs to another class, which is the Michael family. Right? And within the Michael family, he has his own unique name, which is Daniel. So we have a bunch of Michaels, William Michael, Isaiah Michael, Joshua Michael, Daniel Michael. Bunch of Michaels, that separates us from other men and puts us in another class, a smaller class, right? But then inside that class, he has a name that distinguishes him from everybody else. You see that? And so if we wanted to define him, if we're going to use his name to name him, if we're going to define Daniel Michael, we can't use his name. Daniel Michael is Daniel Michael, right? So we would, we would have to use something like Daniel Michael is the seventh or eighth child of William Michael. That's what distinguishes him from all other human beings. You see what I mean? The name Daniel is his name within the family. But we could just, I could have just named the kids numbers. I could have just named the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and that could have been your name. And it would have been your definition too. Now, if we want to name a, a something else, like let's say we want to, to define, like I said, a cat. If we want to define a cat, <clears throat> And we're talking about an individual cat. And I'll just draw a little cat with some whiskers, okay? We have an individual cat. Let's say our cat. We want to define the cat. What is a cat? What's the first thing we would do? We'd identify the genus. So give me a class of things that a cat belongs to. No, no, you're getting to... Give me the class that a cat belongs to. Class. We could, you could say cat, right? How about a bigger, a bigger class than that? Animal. Animal. <clears throat> but isn't man an animal? <clears throat> well, you could, so these questions of how you, def, how you 
separate things into groups is the difficulty of making a definition. It's not easy. The, dif the division of animal, <clears throat> the division of animal, if we were to divide animals into two different groups, one is rational and the other is irrational. So which class does cat belong to? Right? They're in here, irrational animal. And now we'd have to figure out how to identify this cat and define cat. We don't want to define this individual cat. We want to define cat as a class of things. So let's say this was a group of all cats. And we ask, what is a cat, right? We would have to start our definition and say a cat is, name the genus, okay, an animal, and then <coughs> naming the difference is the hard part. Jacob says we should say a purring animal. That's what distinguishes a cat from all other animals. Okay? But I'm, 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 we're not going to actually define it. I want you to see What's difficult about definitions? There are, there are important decisions that need to be made about things, and we don't necessarily know how to make those decisions. You might be able to come up with a good description. You might be able to come up with a good description like it's a purring animal. That's a good description, but that's not necessarily a definition. And the reason why I can say that, Jake, is because how do we know no other animal purrs? I don't know that. How would you prove that no other animal purrs? You see what I'm saying? So it's difficult. You have to prove it's a definition. Okay? So article number one, what is a definition? A definition is a concise... What does concise mean? Clear, sharp, right? A clear, sharp description of any object of thought, and it must... Distinguish that object from all other objects. That's what's difficult, all right? So definitions aren't easy. That's, again, why we don't want to say it in our own words. We don't want to do that because it's not that simple. And if, a, if an expert mathematician has written definitions for us, they're probably helpful definitions. They might not be perfect, but they're probably pretty close. And saying things in our own words is not a good idea. All right? So understand what a definition is. The key words there are concise description that distinguishes the object from all other objects. You got that? A concise description that distinguishes an object from all other objects. That's a definition, okay? Next, second term, quantity. Arithmetic is the study of quantity. What is quantity? Quantity is anything that can be increased or diminished. Anything that can be increased or diminished. Can this hammer be increased or diminished? No. It's a substance. It can't be increased or diminished. Right? What can be increased? The size of the hammer can be increased? Yeah, you know, I can make a bigger hammer. The weight of the hammer, I could make a heavier hammer. The number of hammers, I could buy five hammers. So I can increase the quantity, but I can't increase the thing itself. Right? Quantity is what can be increased or diminished. Quantity is anything which can be increased or diminished. It embraces number and magnitude. So there are two different kinds of quantity. There are two different kinds of quantity. Let me just explain this for a minute. Two different kinds of quantity. So quantity is anything... <clears throat> Anything that can be increased or diminished, that's the definition of quantity. OK? 
Okay? There are two kinds. Our, our textbook says this embraces number and magnitude. And I want to explain this a little differently for you. So this is what you should jot down in your notes. <clears throat> two different kinds two different kinds of quantity. I wouldn't use the names number and magnitude. I would use the names multitude and magnitude, and this comes from classical mathematics. Multitude and magnitude. There are two kinds of quantities. A multitude is a collection of separate things. A multitude is a collection of separate things. So if you think of a, um, a herd of sheep in a field, a collection of separate things all taken together is a multitude. If I was to ask what is one, it would be one of these things. That would be the unit. And a multitude is a collection of separated things. A pile of rocks, a herd of sheep, a pile of coins, like let's say pennies, right? That's a multitude. You count the number of units, the number of individuals in a multitude. A magnitude is one thing. A magnitude is one. And when we talk about a multitude, we ask the question, how many? If you want to talk about the quantity of a multitude, we ask the question, how many are there? How many? When we talk about a magnitude, it's one body, it's one thing. We don't ask how many. We ask how great, how small, how much. And you have to understand the difference between the words many and much. Much refers to size. Many refers to number. Do you understand that? If I say how many, <clears throat> if I talk about your height, I don't say how many are you? How many tall are you? That doesn't make any sense. I, I can say how many inches are you in height? Because you're going to count the number of inches. That's a multitude. Okay? If you see a if you see a um, <clears throat> a piece of wood, you don't ask how many is it. You say how much is it? How long is it? How wide is it? Okay. Multitudes are measured in number. <clears throat> Magnitudes are measured in size. That's the difference. A multitude is a collection of individual things. A collection of separate things. A magnitude is one thing. We measure a magnitude in size. We measure a multitude in number. That's the difference. Okay? <clears throat> so there are two kinds of quantity. That's why your textbook says, instead of multitude, your textbook says number. Because we measure multitude in number. We measure magnitude in size, number and magnitude. Understand that? <clears throat> okay, so there's two kinds of quantity. <clears throat> Let's look back at the book. Two kinds of quantity. Quantity is anything that can be increased or diminished. It embraces number and magnitude, or multitude and magnitude. All right? Number answers the question, how many? Magnitude answers the question, how much? So you have to understand that there's a difference between those two questions. How many is asking for a number. How much is asking for a measure of some size. Okay? That's quantity and the two divisions of quantity. So if I were to ask you about quantity, you could tell me what quantity is, the definition. Quantity is anything that can be increased or diminished. That's the definition of quantity. 
And then we have a division of quantity into two different kinds. The two different kinds of quantity are multitude and magnitude, number and magnitude. Got that? <clears throat> number, multitude, this is why this is important. Multitude is studied in arithmetic. In arithmetic, we study number, we study multitude. Where do we study magnitude? Not in arithmetic. Where do we study magnitude? Geometry. Geometry. So different kinds of quantity have different studies. Geometry is a study of how much. Arithmetic is a study of how many. All right. Next, uh, the third term. What is science? When we use this word science, if you say I'm going to science class. What does science mean? Aristotle used that word, and many modern people use that word, and they don't necessarily mean the same thing by science. In a modern school, in definition number three, it says science is knowledge properly classified. Science is knowledge properly classified, and none of you know what that means. <clears throat> you have all kinds of knowledge. You have knowledge about trees, right? You have knowledge about animals, birds, all kinds of different fish, all sorts of knowledge, but it's not properly classified knowledge. It's not organized information. You see what I mean? Anna knows about animals. Anna knows about airplanes and guns and weapons and military stuff. She knows, she has knowledge about that stuff. But is it properly classified knowledge? Is it organized knowledge of the whole entire thing? No. That knowledge, organized, it's called systematic knowledge, where you know like every detail and you can organize all the information. For example, if I said, do you know the different ranks of the military? Say the army. Do you know the different ranks of the military? Can you name the different ranks? Huh? Okay, you can say private, sergeant, corporal. You can make this list of all these different ranks. Can you write out a list on a piece of paper of every rank all in order from top to bottom? Every single rank all in order? That is knowledge properly classified. You understand the difference? Hmm? Do you know all the ranks in the military and the army? Do you know all the ranks? Some of them, right? Can you organize them to show who's, who's higher than who, or, you know, from top to bottom? No. Do you have knowledge of the ranks of the military? Yes, right? But do you have properly classified knowledge of the mil no do you have do you have science do you know military science no but do you have military knowledge yes so you see the difference you see the difference you know the parts of a car you have knowledge about cars yes you can name the different can you name every part no do you have science no. You have knowledge, but not scientific knowledge. You see the difference? Hmm? You see the difference? Okay. Science is knowledge properly classified. All of the information, all organized. That's science. <clears throat> you see the difference? You can feel the difference between what a scientist has and what a common person has. Hmm? So if you say, I want to be a, an expert in this thing, <clears throat> one of the things that makes a person an expert is the kind of knowledge that they have. The kind of knowledge. To just know, to know some information about something, even to know a lot of information about something, means to be familiar with it. But that's not scientific knowledge. That's not science. Science is to study all of the information 
in an orderly way. Classified means arranged in all of its order. To know the order of a subject is science. You got that? Okay. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Science is knowledge properly classified. Now, Aristotle would add something more to that definition. He would add, science is knowledge properly classified that is absolutely certain. That's a difference. Okay? So not only is it organized, systematic knowledge, but it's absolutely, certainly true. That's a difference between what Aristotle means by science and what we might use by the term science in a modern class or modern subject. All right? But understand what science actually is. Science is knowledge properly classified. So if you live on a farm, you know about animals, you know about plants, you have all kinds of knowledge. But when you go to school and you study a textbook, what you're seeking is this kind of knowledge. You're seeking properly classified, organized, systematic knowledge. That's the difference between science and just general knowledge. Some people, you know, some people criticize book smarts. They'll say, oh, book people or bookworms are just nerds. They don't know how to do stuff. I'm a carpenter. I know how to actually do stuff. I'm a farmer. I know how to actually do, I know how nature works. I'm a farmer. A farmer may not have scientific knowledge of farming. If you go to college and major in agricultural science, you'll learn farming, but you'll learn the science of farming. You see the difference? Hmm? You understand the difference between knowing the science of farming and just being a farmer? It's two different things. Okay? The difference is that a farmer can't necessarily teach someone else how to be a farmer. He, a farmer can't necessarily teach someone else how to grow tomatoes. He may be able to grow tomatoes, but he may not be able to teach someone else how to grow tomatoes, especially if the person is in a different place. If I grow tomatoes in the backyard here, we're in southern North Carolina. What I do to grow tomatoes here, will that work in New Jersey? Maybe not. You see what I mean? So if someone from New Jersey wrote me and asked, how should I grow tomatoes? If I'm a farmer, I may be able to grow tomatoes here, but I may not be able to explain how to grow tomatoes there. But a person who studies the science of agriculture may be able to explain to someone in New Jersey how to grow tomatoes and in North Carolina or in Arizona how to grow tomatoes. You see, you see the difference? <clears throat> so a lot of people are good at things, but they can't teach those things. That's the difference between scientific knowledge and just practical knowledge. Okay. You might become a carpenter and, be, and know how to build a house, but you might only know how to build a certain kind of house. And in another place, you may need to build a different kind of house. A carpenter in North Carolina can't necessarily build a house in Canada because the supplies are different, the climate is different. You know, like under our house, we have a crawl space. We don't have a basement. In New Jersey, we had basements under all the houses. Why are there no basements in North Carolina? Because the water level underground is higher in North Carolina. And if you put a basement under a house, it'll fill up with water. In New Jersey, the water is much lower. You can put a whole floor under the house and have a basement. You can't do that in North Carolina. So building a house in North Carolina is not the same as building a house in New Jersey because the land is different. You understand that? There are people who can build houses in North Carolina who might not be able to build a house in New Jersey. It's a difference between practical knowledge and science. Science is knowledge 
<clears throat> properly classified. You all understand what that means? Science is knowledge properly classified. You understand what that means? Number four, the primary truths of a science are called principles. The primary truths of a science. What that means is the primary truths. What does this word primary mean? Let's, let's use a little illustration. Let's look at an illustration to understand what primary means, okay? <clears throat> what are the primary colors? Think of how many colors there are. There are an infinite number of colors, right? Think of, a, think of a box of crayons. It's got, what, 48 colors in it? But if I were to say, what are the primary colors? What are the primary colors? What are the, what are the most basic colors that all other colors come from? Can you name them? Can you name the primary colors? Take purple. Is purple a primary color? Why not? Two colors, yeah. What colors? What colors make purple? Red and blue. What colors make red? None. No. Okay, so red is a primary color. Blue is a primary color. Yellow is a primary color. <clears throat> Those are the primary colors. If I want to make green, I don't, ma I don't have another color. I just combine blue and yellow, and I make green. If I combine blue and red, I make purple. Now I have five colors. If I combine red and yellow, I have orange. Now I have six colors. White and black. White and black are actually combinations of the colors. Black is the absence of all color. White is the presence of all color. Now I have six colors, but three primary colors. And I can keep combining them in a million different ways, right? Because now I can combine red and purple. Now I can combine red and green, which would be pretty gross, basically make brown. But now we can start combining all these colors in more and more combinations, and we can make millions of colors, like when you make colors on a website by changing the code. There's, you can make a million different colors. But when you boil it all down, it all starts with three primary colors. And red, blue, and yellow are called primary colors. Because all of it, so if you wanted a pack of crayons, you don't need to buy the 64 pack. You could just buy a five pack. You could just buy red, blue, and yellow, white, and black. And you can make all your own colors. But that's what primary colors are. Now, in science, <clears throat> what we learn here in this next rule is that in science, the primary truths of a science are called principles. The primary truths of a science. Okay? are called principles. The word principle, think about Latin, in principio. That's the same word. What does it mean? In principio. Beginning. The beginning. So a principle is a beginning. It's a truth that's the beginning. And other truths come from it. Okay? Other truths come from it. When you, when you think about them, when you, when you meditate on them, you can make conclusions about other things based on the principles, right? So if we take a principle, like I could take a principle of nature, the idea of gravity. Modern scientists say that there is a, <clears throat> there's a force called gravity. And it means that there's a force in the earth that draws physical objects to it. Right? So if I hold this pen up in the air, the earth is trying to pull that pen down to the ground. Right? So if I let this pen go, what will happen? How do you know that? Because you start with this principal truth. 
And then you reason. And you make a conclusion. You see that? That's our time jet. Okay, so you reason. You start with a general principle, and then you reason. And so when I drop the pen, you say, hey, you know what's going to happen? When you let that pen go, it's going to fall because of this principle of gravity. And you just meditate, you reflect on the principles and how it applies and allows you to predict what's going to happen. Okay? Here's another principle, and, and these are things you learn in physics. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless they're acted upon by another force. Okay, that's a principle. It's one of the laws of motion in modern science. I'm not saying it's true, but it's, it's a theory, it's a principle, a law that men have made. Objects that are in motion tend to stay in motion. So anytime that there's a change, what does it mean? If the clouds are moving from the east to the west, and then tomorrow you look and they're moving to the south, objects that are in motion stay in motion unless they're acted upon by a force. So if you look at the clouds and one day they're moving from the east, the next day they're moving to the south, based on the law of motion, what can you conclude? Some force must exist that changed the direction of the clouds. Right? So you start with the principle and you, you meditate and reflect on the principle. You observe what's going on. Think about the principle and you use the principle to explain what's going on. But you have to know the principles. And if you don't know the principles, you have nothing to reflect on. You understand that? Where do you learn the principles? Studies. You don't learn the principles by walking around in the front yard. Okay? And what wise men seek to do, what wise men seek to do is figure out what the principles are. That's really what philosophy is. Figuring out what the principles are. Is there really something called gra does gravity really exist? Is it real? Is there really a force that pulls things to the ground? Or is it just a theory? Is the law of motion real or is it just a theory? Okay, that's th that's what philosophy seeks to answer. Once the philosophers answer those questions, philosophers figure out the principles and then scientists use the principles. You see what I mean? Sometimes scientists can prove that the principles are not true because they can prove that something happens that contradicts what the principle says and the principle is actually false and they may need to change it. Okay? <clears throat> so science is knowledge properly classified. The primary truths of a science, the first truths of a science are called principles. Right? We're going to go just a little bit longer. The primary truths of a science are called principles. That's definition four. Definition five, art. Now, when you think about art, you think about drawing and painting, but that's not what this is talking about. It's not talking about fine arts. Art in mathematics, in science, art is the practical application of a principle. The practical application of a principle or the principles of a science. Art is the practical application of a principle or the principles of a science. So if I'm going to build a fence, right, okay, um, I have wood. I can go out in the woods and just chop down a tree and I have wood. But is that what I use to build a fence? No, or a house or anything else. What I do is I take that wood and I shape it 
to a specific shape that I want, and then I use those parts that I prepare to build something, like this desk. This desk is built of steel. Is steel natural? Can you go out into the world and get steel someplace? No, you can't. Steel is actually manufactured. You have to produce it. But you can get iron from the earth. Iron is natural, right? Is this desk natural? No, this desk is art. This desk is an example of art. Man made this desk through the application of principles of science. This house is built by art. It's built by the application of principles of science. You understand that? Okay. Art is the application of a principle or the principles of science. So when we study a science, we learn the principles. We learn the principles when we study a science. And then in our life, we apply those principles and that's the work of art. That's the work of problem solving. If you have a problem you need to solve, let's say you need to build a boat. Where do you start to build a boat? You have to, you have to know the principles of science, and then you have to apply those principles to figure out how to build a boat. Right? You have to figure out what you should build it out of. Should you build it out of steel? Should you build it small or wide? Should you build it tall or flat? How do you figure those things out? You have to know the principles of sciences, right? If it's tall and narrow, will it float? Why not? If you build a boat that's tall and narrow like this, will it float? Why not? Because all of the weight, well, yeah, that's not why. All of the weight of the boat will be concentrated on one point on the water and it will push through the water, right? But if you build the boat flat, the same amount of weight can be on that boat, but that weight is spread out over a wider body of water and the water can hold up that weight. So boats are made flat and wide, not tall and thin. You understand? So you take the principles of what causes something to float and you use that knowledge of that principle to build the boat. If you're a dum-dum and you don't know the principles, you'll build 10 boats that sink before you finally build one that floats. But that's not science. That's called trial and error. Okay? If you knew the principles of sciences, you would be able to build a boat that floats on the first try because you would be able to use the principles to decide how to build. Understand that? A, a person who has real science can do things with art the first try, whereas a person who doesn't know the principles might be able to build something that works, but it might take him 10 tries. Okay? Art is the application of a principle or the principles of a science. Art is skill. All right? You understand that? Art is the application, the use of the principles of sciences to actually do things, to solve problems. In definitions six and seven, we get into the definitions of mathematics, which we've already talked a little bit about, but we're going to stop this lesson there. So that's our first hour of Modern Arithmetic 4. We did a lot of background discussion. We talked about a lot of ideas and information that is important to understand before we get into this. Um, what I would like you to do is memorize these definitions. And you, I want you to make sure you know what they mean. So if you read, science is knowledge properly classified, what does that mean? I want you to make sure you don't just memorize the words. Remember, sentences are signs of ideas. If you don't have the idea, then this is just gibberish, right? You have to have the idea in your mind. 
Science is knowledge properly classified. You have to have that idea in your mind. Science is complete, organized knowledge of a subject. You understand that? Remember, I use, the, I use the example of military ranks. Somebody may know some of the ranks, but that's not science. Someone who can write out every rank in order, that's science. Okay? Make sure you understand what principles are. Make sure you understand what an art is. Um, that's all for our first lesson in Modern Arithmetic 4. Any questions to wrap up? Memorize definitions, okay?